I'm going to present on um, log management. It's a, a topic I've been looking into for a couple of years. Um, my interest was aroused by working a little bit closer than normal with a, some um, customers at Pocona um, that needed to turn on the audit log. Um, so um, it's kind of the, the, the seed that bred um, more research and work with um, a certain set of tools. Um, so as I said, it was a, a Pocona customer, which implies that I work for Pocona, not just follow Pocona clients around. Um, I'm a remote DBA by trade. Uh, went into a bit of management, but technical manager. So um, the four years I've been at Pocona have been um, mostly in, in technical roles and, and helping the clients out there. Before Pocona, I worked for Pythian for a short stint. Um, similar thing, remote DBA, MySQL. Um, so a couple of years there, learning lots of uh, new technologies, uh, new problems. Um, prior to that, I had a few years at Nokia, the services department of Nokia that, that kind of did Spotify before Spotify. Um, and that was a mixture of SQL Server DBA and MySQL DBA. So you can probably tell from the accent, I'm from the UK. Um, so I've done the arduous 11 hour flight to get over to uh, sunny Santa Clara. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, some assumptions, admissions, and disclaimers about the talk. Um, this is the first time I've presented it, um, so um, your feedback will be valuable as it evolves, but hopefully touch, a lot, touch a, amongst um, most of the, the contextual information about log management and, and why I think we should uh, reevaluate what we do with logs. Um, I'm not going to talk about in any great detail, Windows as a platform that causes logging. Um, I don't use it. I wouldn't really do it much justice. Um, so just know that most of the toolings and the, the concepts that I do discuss are um, transferable to Windows. Um, and this is also not, as may um, claim, a deep dive into Elasticsearch. That's a, a huge topic, a big product. Um, and again, I just wouldn't do it justice in 50 minutes. So as I've um, already said far too many times, the word logs and log management, um, have a look at uh, the simplicity of, of what a log is. I think um, it's easy to take them for granted and overlook them. Um, they don't normally warrant um, a hell of a lot of thought. Um, they're just there, right? They, they um, exist on our file systems. Um, and you know, as I said before, I started looking with any vigor at Pocona's audit plugin. I wasn't too fussed about logs. You know, I used them now and again, troubleshooting. Yeah, um, they weren't a, a big feature. But um, the talk progresses into looking at log management, what that is, what it means for us, and then log analytics. Um, so the first big question of the day is, what is a log? Has anyone ever asked themselves what a log is? Um, boiling it down, a log is just a stream of messages stored in time sequence, allowing, allowing us to see what has gone on in a, an event. Um, so the most basic recipe for what would be declared semi-useful logging is a timestamp and a message. So that allows us to answer the question, what happened? and when. And when we're talking about logs, we can put them into two distinct buckets. Um, we have human readable logs and machine readable logs. Um, scratch machine readable logs off early. They're transaction logs, um, binary logs in MySQL world, or op logs from MongoDB, write ahead logs, anything that's moving data between software or infrastructure. We want to talk about human readable. So these are our um, plain text um, event files, log files. Um, they are really are um, debug, troubleshooting, um, accounting log files. 
um, that we're going to you know, focus on. Um, the next big question is, why the hell do we do it? What's the point of logging? And um, I guess the, the simple, concise answer to that is to answer questions that we have. Um, now, being a techie, I gravitate to answering the technology questions. But logs also have the answers to questions like, um, how many unique visitors were on the site? How many? Um, um, People signed up to our newsletter, for example. Um, we can answer in, uh, questions such as, when's the best time to take the site down for maintenance? Um, we can see activity, um, even revenue. Um, so we can split difficult questions up like that, um, as well as you know, answering the question about why is the database so slow? Um, it's, it's really um, a huge, vast collection of data that would um, allow us to, to answer questions not only for our own technical uh, workspaces but for the broader business as well. And the main problem is that logging is screwed. It's broken, borked, whatever um, disgusting word you want to use. Legacy logging really sucks. Um, how many people can tell me exactly what every element on that line means. Does anyone know where it's from? Apache, correct. Um, I mean, we can look at it. And you know, I don't have much to do with Apache. But as, a, as somebody that works in technology, I can see IP addresses. Um, most humans can identify a date. But then the message you know, further down the end of the um, row there is, is, is really contextual to somebody who knows Apache logs. Um, anyone familiar with this? That's uh, MySQL's slow query log. Um, so this is a single event over six lines. Um, could be more, could be less. Um, but again, it's, a, it's an event, a sample of um, our time and a message that's supposedly giving us some information. So again, I'm a DBA. I can pick out the SQL. But you know, I pass that to a layman. It's, uh, it's difficult to, to gain context. Any guesses on this one? Perfect. Syslog. Syslog is probably the clusterfuck of all um, logging. Um, it's essentially the bin, the garbage, the waste disposal for um, most routers, IDS, uh, firewalls, even databases can log in here, um, your operating system. Uh, you know, This is something from home, fail to ban running on um, one of my public facing machines. Um, and you know, because there's so many variations of log lines in syslog, um, passing them um, you have to have at least seen it once, right? Or else you, you'll not get the structure. Anyone have to read these? Yeah, it's a headache just looking at it on a slide. <clears throat> so Java exception, application exceptions, um, pretty nasty. Um, here's a nice little one. Who knows what's going on here? Source? DMESC. Plugged in a USB drive. What time did I do it? Hard to tell, right? <laughs> this is an unfair one. Nobody will claim to know this one. It's from a, a Percona application. But again, we have information that we can extract immediately from this. It's um, dates, um, log levels, host names, messages. OK, it's simple. But um, common thread across all of those examples of logs that you know, they're relatively common in the space we work in. And, and the theme of them all is that they're all different. There's not one of them looks like the other. Um, and that amplifies the difficulty of, of answering you know, the breadth of questions 
that we might have across the business when logging is in play. So we infer that all these logs require expertise. You know, if we go back to the Java example, I'm not going to take a, a Java exception apart. I'm going to pass that to a Java developer. Um, similarly, I'm sure that application developers aren't necessarily going to be too interested in MySQL slow logs. So that would come to me. Um, but all of those examples fall under the category of unstructured logging, or at best, semi-structured logging, because it's um, inconsistencies, um, messages are all over the place. There's nothing really um, declaring what, what order the data is in and what the data means. Here's um, an exception to the rule, and hopefully something we'll see more often um, is uh, an excerpt from Pocono's server, Pocono's server's audit log, and it's an example of a structured log. So in this case, it's an, a JSON object. And it's far from rocket science to make applications do this. Um, we have context. We can see. I mean, I could probably give this to my wife and ask her um, to tell me what user was involved. And she'd be able to tell me um, what time is easy as well. All the elements are there for me to, to create an accurate assessment of when this happened. Which brings me on to the next point. Timestamps are fucked as well. Um, I'm sure this is an easy one to recognize, the epoch, but can anyone tell me without looking at Google what day, week, month, year that was? Probably not. It's good for machines, right? It's, it's easy for machines to pass this. We look at it, you know, if we have to, to jump onto a log file and troubleshoot it, uh, it's a waste of time. We, you know, we're back and forth on Google trying to work out when this occurred. Then we have um, more of a standardized date timestamp. Um, this falls under the category of an ISO 8601 date timestamp. And this, for use of a better word, is probably um, the closest we'll get to a good thing. Um, we still have a bit of work to do. You know, again, without seeing many of these, what, you know, okay, T, easy, time, Z, what the hell? I can't remember Z being part of the time anywhere, but it's a, a time zone. So this is nice. We can look at it with our eyes and infer the time and, and even um, use our software to parse this. It's, it's a standard most programming languages can handle it. This one is from our MySQL slow log. Uh, it can be difficult. There's no time zone offset. We're not sure when this happened, UTC or um, daylight savings. There's no, we, there's, no, there's no clue. We're also maybe a, a bit in the dark whether this happened in 2014 or 2022. Um, you know, it's not that clear. And of course, um, logging in the future is, is yet to be invented, but um, you get my meaning. Um, syslog, uh, again, another example of why syslog is useless. February 12th, what year? No idea. And then our Apache date timestamp is really beautiful. Um, we've got shortened month um, in alphanumerics. We have the day. We're delimiting the date from the time using a colon, and then delimiting the time elements with colons too. Um, and then we have an offset all wrapped nicely in square brackets. So. With all these variations on dates and logs, we're starting to build up a nice file of one-liners to parse all these out. So we begin to manage our library of um, useful tools to parse log entries. So quick word of advice, if you're blue sky in a project and you want to um, invent a new timestamp, please don't. Use something that's already out there. Unix timestamps, OK, they're fine. We can parse them. Um, can't really read them, um, or use one of the ISO 8601 variations. Um, do yourself a favor, talk to other people in your company, see what they're using. Um, standardize on something and stop causing headaches. The next problem with logging is the sheer volume of logs that we can generate, because not only are we growing in terms of infrastructure, um, everything logs, as I said before, routers, firewalls, IDS, operating systems, database servers, application servers, 
the crappy little scripts I write, I try and log out. Um, and that's just huge to try and consume. Then multiply that by the amount of servers that we now run. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we probably survived on a LAMP stack on a single server. Nowadays, we're talking tens, hundreds, thousands um, of servers across multiple data centers. So we have a problem on one of your application servers in your farm of thousands. How the hell are you supposed to do that with logs? We've got the Internet of Things. We've got containers. We've got transient cloud and serverless technologies now. So how the hell are we supposed to administer all these logs and, and gain insight and context? Being able to access these logs as well. So in the cloud paradigm, we've got RDS. We've got AWS um, abstractions. Um, getting the logs might need endpoints for APIs. It might need access through consoles. Um, to gather the events that we're interested in. Um, accessing logs across your businesses as well, um, the age-old paradigm of um, dev versus ops. You know, you've got a problem on production, it's application. Um, your developers don't have access, so you become the guy in the middle passing them logs. Um, not really in your job description. And then with each log, there's a management overhead. So um, you might be bound to some compliance. You might have to yeah, hang on to your email at, um, logs for numerous years. So where do you put them? How long do you need to retain them? When the time's up, you know, you need some software there to recycle, to purge, to archive. So there is management overhead with logs um, as we do it now um, in, in the legacy way. The tools aren't that smart either, right? So we go and try and find our application server that's causing all these errors. Um, so we we, we stand at the cliff edge of, of our thousand instances and, and we get grep out. Um, going to be wonderful as we, we use SSH to collect uh, maybe thousands of logs to, to parse for 500 errors. Um, it's not that smart. So my advice is we need to get a little bit more elegant with this. Um, beyond the need to rewrite everybody's logging strategy, which I believe and researchers said that there's been a couple of attempts to standardize logging um, that have fallen flat in the face, probably because nobody wants to change the vendor-based logging. I mean, even today, MySQL 5.7, um, by default, we get inconsistent error logs. Um, we're logging with two different timestamps in the same log, which is ridiculous. Um, we also have like three or four different types of logs coming out of the same kind of software. Um, so it's, it's really time we need to, to, to change things. And the methodology to change this is to introduce um, log management. Again, as I was researching material for the talk, I fell upon this um, log maturity scale. Um, it was written by a security expert, um, a guy called Raphael Marti. Um, I guess security and logs have been hand in hand for decades now. Um, but he proposed this scale of, of maturity. So um, there's several stops along the way. You may find um, yourself in here somewhere, um, and that will give you an indication whether you need to do some more work um, or pat yourself on the back. So the first stop along the maturity scale is nothing. Um, I hope nobody here is at this point. Um, completely ignorant to their logs um, and storing nothing, just letting logs fill disks before they get deleted. Then we go into a phase of collecting. Um, again, compliance reasons, maybe. Uh, we have all our email logs. We need to keep them. So you know, we send them to S3 or something, um, sit on them and delete them when we can. And then we dawns on us that logs are pretty useful. Um, there's something in there that we can um, leverage. We can find out why something broke, when something broke. So we go into troubleshooting mode. Um, we're still not doing anything particularly interesting. Again, it's just that one-to-one -one relationship. There's a problem. I'll go to the log, find the issue. We move into a period where repetitive strain injury comes in. We uh, have to keep going to the same logs or the same types of logs. So we end up saving our searches. Um, persisting these one-liners to our little scratch pad that we save in our, uh, on our desktop for quick use. Um, 
and it quickly dawns on us again, be quite useful to share these, right? Um, so we stick them on the wiki, something I'm guilty of doing recently as well. Um, our managed services logs can be quite useful, and I've just seen 100 different ways of, of trying to work out why replication was delayed or um, what was holding metadata locks. So published some guide internally on, on how to search through the logs to find this info. Um, then somebody realizes that your searches are pretty good and start asking you for reports. So you adopt um, an admin role and you're uh, sending out reports based on maybe whether your backups are failing or um, again, accounting information. You know, how many times did this happen um, and why? Um, we can add some intelligence in at this point, start alerting on things. Um, maybe we have um, some concerns with firewall um, information and firewall logs, some um, devious actor you know, amongst us. Um, we identify that there's lots more logs and events to capture. Um, everything is sending events and messages. Let's capture them, um, utilize them, correlate. So we've got now an ability to um, compare our application logs and our database logs and answer some more interesting questions. Based on all these steps, we arrive at visualization. Um, this is probably at the healthier end of, of the log maturity scale where we start to draw um, intelligence from our log files um, cross comparisons. We're, we're now taking thousands of log files and making a single picture of them um, to give us some insight. Um, there's a bit more if you're interested, check it out. Um, it was quite eye-opening, the level of detail that the security guys you know, need to go in terms of logging, um, log analysis. Um, and really, I think with many um, SaaS systems arriving um, in this space, it's evident that security concerns, troubleshooting, debugging, auditing, all of this big data that's right in front of us is, um, is poised for a, a, a drill down. So log management, again, is the, the theme of this talk. Um, so the path to centralization and analysis um, really begs the question how. Um, and previously, there have been um, a narrow count on tools of, of, of how you can achieve this. Um, we have options in both the open source markets and commercial markets. Um, and I think it's wholly down to a business decision. Do we want to roll our own? Do we want to maintain um, a, a huge amount of infrastructure um, to, to contain all of our logging and event management information? Um, or do we trust the expertise of a third party? So as I said at the beginning, my adventure in this space has been closely coupled to the Elastic Stack or Elk. Um, in the open source world, syslog, although I've trashed it quite a lot already, is a method of centralization and, and managing your logs. Our syslog is, a, is a, 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 an improved way. Um, Greylog2 is in um, the similar bracket to Elastic Stack. Um, just so happens, as Elastic Stack is where I spent all my time. So we need to traverse at least four major stages of log management and, and analysis. And that's um, to generate, collect, ship these events somewhere, store them and analyze them, and then move them away from our environment, move them off our environment, because um, we just can't keep collecting these forever. So a log event has a lifespan. Um, so we can, we can meet it on its journey um, from creation through to deletion. So we ship these events off. Um, we centralize them. So at this central point, we might decide we need to enrich the data that, that's being um, pipelined. Uh, we need to put it somewhere, somewhere um, where we have the tools to analyze the data from them. Um, from there, we can create this concept of visualization and, and more. Um, and then we archive or delete, depending on whether we need them. So enter ELK. Um, ELK is the legacy term given to a set of three tools, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. 
Um, after these three tools um, being widely used together, uh, Elastic Search, the company, decided to acquire the L and the K, bring them in-house, um, which generated a, a new faction once they added um, a new log shipping uh, tool to it called Beats. So we evolved to Elk B, which unfortunately died. Maybe it was the cold weather. Um, and we have a much more structured um, stack to refer to. So um, probably a future proofing thing as they add tools, elastic stack can be quite a transient term. Anyway, um, as I said, the, the journey to elastic stack introduced these, these stages. So um, each tool has its own strength and ability to um, solve some of the problems that we incur with logging. Um, so first of all, the beginning of the journey, um, beats is our method of moving events away from log files, away from the origin of um, its, its birth. Um, and it, it's our, it becomes our shipper. Um, beats is, is um, a small application you will run at the point of um, the log event generation. Um, of, well, of a log event, um, there, there are many terms that, that Beats will encapsulate. Um, but Beats comes in um, a self-contained Go, Go binary. It's very lightweight. Um, and it means that it's cheap to put on your database server. It's cheap to put on your application server. Um, and it allows you to move information um, from source um, into the pipeline. Um, Beats as a product comes in different flavors. There's packet beat for networking information, metric beat, which gathers um, system resource information. So it's kind of like top, um, but it's modular. So they've built out MySQL modules. They've built out um, uh, MongoDB, Postgres, Apache, Nginx. There's, there's lots of um, pre-built solutions with beats. Then there's file beat, which is kind of the, the, the best one to go through with us today. Um, this is like tail minus F over the network. It's going to take our events and, and move them into our central locations. Um, win log beat, as I did say, I'm not going to talk about Windows. Um, it's there. It's going to read Windows log managers um, and ship the events from there. And latest edition is heartbeat, which is quite nifty. It allows you to um, configure um, the monitoring of a service. So you're able to send to um, your log pipeline um, whether or not a service is up or down, and take decisions on, on that information too. Um, installation of all these tools is extremely easy. Um, but I kept the, the, the slide only in the beat section. But you don't really install any of the Elastic Stack tools in the traditional installation way. There are repos and RPMs and, and dev files, but fundamentally all it's doing is, is putting a binary on your system I'm ready for you to run. So it's extremely easy. Um, even I can do it. Um, simple is, well, keep it simple, stupid is probably the, the ethos that these guys work through to ensure that I couldn't screw up my log file um, collection configuration. Um, and file beats, as an example, um, works with YAML structures for its um, configuration. Um, so just a quick example of how simple it would be to, to set up a file beat instance that's going to ship all of the logs under var log, um, star.log. It's going to glob the directory and, and gather up anything in there. Um, because it's Go, it gets to use Go routines. So um, it's one instance, and it can um, in parallel, um, do this tail dash f across many files. Um, then, really simply, we have a couple of um, different outputs that we can send our beats traffic to. Elasticsearch being one example, um, and as well, Logstash. So, if we, we want to do any um, enrichment of our data, um, Logstash is also a, an option. Um, so, beats is, is really cheap, it's really easy to get started with. 
um, and it, it it's pretty much um, by now a mature um, and feature full prospect. So we've got um, again, like I said, all those different flavors from just sucking in files um, through the modular bits of of file beats um, and metric beats. Um, so we can actually um, deploy beats with a specific flavor. So MySQL, Postgres, um, we don't have to do any more lifting. Um, once we've got our events flowing through beats, we need to, to ship them somewhere. And, and the first option to do this um, in terms of the Elastic stack is Logstash. Um, Logstash has been around a long time um, in comparison to beats, and it was the de facto shipper. Um, back when I started looking at this. However, it's, um, it's a little bit heavier because it's written in Ruby, JRuby, and depends on the JVM. So I guess there's a lot of pushback on installing JVM where it's not wanted. Um, but we can put this in kind of middleware mode. Um, it becomes a stop along the, the, the pipeline for our event shipping um, and centralization. Um, as with all these tools, they're open source, they're free to use, um, and again, easy to get started with. Log stash installation is a, pretty much exactly the same as Beats. There's uh, repositories, uh, tarballs, um, and once it's installed, it's a quick configuration file. Um, can get kind of complex depending on what you want to do, but if, if we're talking quick and dirty, events from your server into your analytics platform, um, it's, it's easy to get rolling. Um, as I showed you the, the beginning um, of the, the configuration, the first stage in Beats, shipping from Beats into Logstash, um, we can do this with several options. Um, one of the, the, the key components of the Beats to Logstash communication is that we can do this with TLS enabled. Um, so if we want to do inter uh, data center communications or even into the cloud, into the public traffic, we can do this with, with uh, full protection. Um, input, uh, as we'll see in a moment, um, the input block is essentially what we're listening for. Um, so again, this can be, this is modular, it's a, it, it can be expanded upon, um, and there are already lots of pre-rolled solutions. Um, so uh, we can listen on the wire. We can listen. We can take things out of files directly. Um, a plethora of options. Logstash then moves into its second phase, which is filter. So this is really the enrichment stage of our uh, event journey, um, and really the powerhouse of of Logstash is the ability to. Um, mutate, standardize, um, drop, enrich. So we can run functions across um, our, our data as it, as it comes in. So we can get these ugly ass syslog messages. We can pull the data out we need um, and put them in um, contextual data types and, and move it to the next stage. Um, what you might also um, see here, notice here is that, that there are um, tokens that align with the various parts of the file. So we've got um, the syslog timestamp, which is, is um, again, quite a useless construct. Um, and, and we're able to pull this from the packet, uh, the, the, the payload, um, and we can transform it. So we're, we're able to feed Logstash with um, a recipe so that we, we don't have to write different parses for it for every variation of timestamp. So this is another one of the bugbears um, nailed. Um, we can also work through most of these um, configuration blocks with conditionals. Um, so as I said, it can get nice and complex, uh, or as complex as you need to. Um, you can you know, run conditionals based on the incoming payload. So if it's a syslog, um, event, then it needs to go through this. If it's a, um, an Apache log, it might need to, to go through other transformations. Um, you're definitely going to want to um, reformat timestamps as you go through. Um, 
special data types um, in different um, log events, um, such as IP addresses, can be enriched as well. So you can put these through geolocation um, lookups. You can do DNS lookups on IP addresses. Um, and you know, formatting things, uppercase, lowercase, um, there's lots and lots to go through. If you've got sensitive data in your stream as well, at this point you can apply some obfuscation. So you can um, hash uh, sensitive data out as you wish. Um, and then finally, you arrive at the output stage. Um, again, this is powerful because you can make decisions um, on the fly with where your data ends up or if your data ha has a, a, another action to take. So there, there may be um, a path of trajectory where um, an event requires an alert. So you can, you can fork um, this uh, process to, to send a pager duty event and then wake somebody up. Um, alternatively, um, you can make decisions on, on where this goes, uh, not necessarily Elasticsearch. Um, maybe you want to move it to Redis. Maybe you want to put it in a queue, um, all configurable. And again, Logstash is a mature product, so um, plenty of plugins available. Um, so some examples of the plugins that I've been um, referring to. We can go from plain files. We can read from databases, our friend Syslog, um, various queuing and, and brokering can be done. Um, we filter on um, mutate. Um, oh, one thing I didn't spend any time on is this, um, this Grok concept. Um, so to, to address these tokens, um, these are pre, um, not pre-compiled, but, but um, pre-loaded regex patterns that are native to Logstash. So we don't, we don't have to, however we can, um, write our own regex for uh, parsing log events. So we've got the ability to, so you know, our homegrown stuff can be parsed out, um, but we don't have to spend time picking through Nginx logs and, and um, writing regex for all of these things. Um, encoding data on the fly to JSON, YAML, um, and then the endpoints, um, all sorts of things, monitoring platforms, um, IM clients, databases, um, SaaS systems. So Log Log Logly is a, um, a cloud service for log management. So, you know, don't want to run anything after this. I'm just going to log stash and, and pipe out to somebody else's servers. Um, yeah, PagerDuty, Nagios, we want alerts on something. Um, something's, going, something's going wrong or um, somebody's in the garden that shouldn't be. Um, as I inferred, timestamps are a huge pain in the ass. So um, Grok makes that easy with our um, regex tokens, our, our predefined regex filtering. Um, so we get to do this instead of this. Um, so we, don't, we no longer have to maintain uh, some really horrible said or orc commands, maybe even Perl. Um, nothing against Perlists. Um, the next motion is store and analyze. And the tool we've elected for this is Elasticsearch. Um, I'm no Elasticsearch expert. I know a few things, but the Elastic Stack really doesn't call for you to be a, a deep diver on Elasticsearch. It's an interesting technology. Um, I have done a little bit of reading on it. It's um, another Java application um, governed by the JVM, um, standing on the shoulders of Apache Lucene, which is a, a, a Java library for full text search. Um, it has a RESTful-ish API. It doesn't, it's not strongly RESTful, but looks like it um, pretends to be. And then when you get into the clustering um, paradigms of Elasticsearch, you get fault tolerance and scalability um, as a side effect. Um, mentioning Lucene, Lucene works with um, what's known as an inverted index. Um, which is different to our relational indexes. Um, simply put, 
we index documents with Elasticsearch and the Lucene engine tokenizes all the terms that we have in our data um, and then it compiles a, a mapping to where these um, terms appear in our documents, um, their offsets and their frequencies, uh, which facilitates um, fast lookups um, in much the same way as you would, um, the, the results are much the same way as you would, would work with a search engine. Um, to visualize things better for me, I always kind of return home and, and draw comparisons. So um, the terminologies we would use in, in Elasticsearch when we talk about the data is, is indexes. And of course, we know indexes from our relational worlds, um, even our non-relational databases. Um, but then we have types, documents, and fields. But, but what do they, um, what are their equivalents in, in old money? Um, so indexes can be kind of thought about like tables. They are collections of documents that have a similar context or structure. Um, reliably told that types are going to go away. They're kind of like a, a name spacing. Um, they're not overly useful. Um, documents are like our, our rows, our, our rows of data. Um, and the fields within those documents are columns. Um, we feed Elasticsearch JSON. Um, so these, these JSON documents are what we refer to um, when we talk about um, Elasticsearch documents. The way we store data in Elasticsearch is using Lucene's sharding concept. So each um, node will have, by default, um, or an index is built by default with five shards. And these shards get distributed out across the cluster. So we have some um, data redundancy um, and um, durab uh, resilience or fault tolerance, if you like, um, because we can start to um, um, scale the, the cluster out in, in um, such a way that if there was a, a failure, we wouldn't be uh, losing data. So we have primary shards and replica shards. Um, if in this case, node one disappears, node three has that data and the, the replica shard would be promoted to primary, and then a reintroduction of, of um, a new shard or a new node with new shard capacity um, could um, trigger a rebalance. So as I described, we kind of get um, high availability, a um, bit of data redundancy. Uh, replica shards can actually be read from, so we kind of have some efficiency built in as well. Uh, we query Elasticsearch using RESTful style um, gets, puts, um, you know, the, the HTTP methods. Um, so we would offer Elasticsearch a payload um, with JSON formats um, in, to enable us to, to query, to select data, to, to ask for result sets. Um, and the same for um, writes as well. So we would use put methods to create documents um, and get methods to retrieve documents. So um, I hope that's not totally alien to folks. Um, I think you know, JSON and, and HTTP have been around for quite some time now. Um, I think finally, the, the um, notable um, information about Elasticsearch is, is the node types. Um, nodes come in different flavors. Um, we have data nodes, master nodes, client nodes, ingest nodes, and tribe nodes. I've got five minutes left, so I'm, I'm not going to dig too deep in those. Um, but essentially, this is our now our, uh, where our data lives. Um, we have the means and the tools to query this data, to create aggregations, to, to understand um, uh, the functions we can use um, across the data that, that Elasticsearch provides us. So we're indexing our um, lines of our, our strings from our log files all the way through beats, log stash, persist them in Elasticsearch so that we can um, run our analysis over. So it's, it's entirely feasible to just do full text searches, um, but we can be um, a little more elegant. Um, the candy comes from the K from Elk Cabana, um, which is a JavaScript application um, 
that allows us to easily analyze and very easily um, visualize the data that we uh, administer. So um, it's a, a front end to the data effectively. It queries Elasticsearch data, um, allows us to write ad hoc queries, allows us to write term-based queries, um, and to create some nice visualizations um, with our data. Um, rather dumbly this morning, I cleared all the indexes in my data set. So I, I had to grab some screenshots from the web. Um, but it does illustrate in a, in a nice way how beautiful our log files can become. Um, they can provide us with lots of, of information that we could be um, at foul for ignoring um, for long periods of time. Um, plotting time series data is now possible as well in Kibana and Elasticsearch. Um, and this is all um, relatively easy to set up, relatively cheap in terms of um, cogn cognitive effort to get, to get going. Um, I said the installation, the configuration is abnormally simple. Um, even the Elasticsearch, which is, you know, has lots more knobs and, and tunables, um, isn't hugely, um, when you compare it with something like MySQL, isn't hugely um, at the bane of the configuration file. Um, one of the things that we used um, in, in this workflow to help us out at Procona, um, and I can only show you a sliver because of the information contained in the, um, the data um, exposes customer names, so I will uh, refrain from um, going too deep in it. But one of the use cases we found most recently for it was to um, take the data from our alerting. So again, um, event-based um, data. We're, we're pulling it from directly from PagerDuty. Um, it goes through the, the cycle, um, hits a little Lambda function on the way through, um, and we push it directly to um, a, an elastic search cluster. Um, and what that's afforded us to do, if you'll just bear with me a moment. is start to take a bit more context on what we are doing with our um, alerting. So um, the back end stuff that we have already provisioned is a little richer than this, but just to give you some ideas. Now this is all, um, it has been a mixture of, of log files and, and alerting events. Um, but we can get a nice breakdown across our multi-tenancy managed services service um, of you know where the pain points are. Um, we can clearly see disk space is um, um, a potential issue for our customer base. Um, this isn't a customer in particular; it's it's everyone. Um, the you know the the levels that we see within um, the logging, um, a breakdown on the teams that get involved with um, our our um, pager models. And then um, rather simple but quite handy um, word cloud based on the, the services that we monitor. Um, so the bigger the service, um, the more often the page. So you know, we start to be able to, to weed things out on whether the, the, the volume of alerts are um, directly linked to the, the usefulness of the alert. So load average um, is one that you know, I personally don't think is too useful to send alerts over. Um, so you know, we can start to take real life actions based on um, event data on, on improving the service, improving what we do with our clients. Um, but when all said and done, one of the uh, other questions we must ask ourselves is, um, should we really be um, introducing all this new infrastructure into our, you know, is this a solution looking for a problem? Um, you know, with all the, you know, the volume of logs that I've described, um, 
do we need to, to spin up you know, another 50, 100 instances of something to, to just look at log files? Um, but now you know that you can do it. Should you do it? Should you outsource this to a, a cloud platform to allow you, know, you to benefit from the elasticity of, of somebody else maintaining things? Um, but I think at least the Elk stack or the Elastic stack gives you the, the option, gives you the, the ability to roll something up fast. Um, and in all um, disclosure, we decided that we weren't going to bother with um, building out infrastructure for this, and we just partnered with a, um, a cloud provider. So um, whilst I enjoyed the journey, it was certainly um, uh, a cost that you know, we had to, to um, bypass. So with that, um, any questions, any comments? I'd be happy to, uh, to hear, hear you out. Um, but uh, that is the, the final stop.